Hi everyone, I'm Manya Bajaj. Welcome you all to this amazing workshop on Ivy League Profile, Development and Building Up University Experience. Uh, so we have three speakers today. First of all, we have uh, Michael Stonks, who serves as the International Director of for IPERC Academy and has been an active in the international education industry for over nine years cultivating partnerships with hundreds of U.S. and Canadian secondary schools, counseling over 1,000 students worldwide, and collaborating with education organizations in over a dozen countries. I welcome you, sir. Then, Hello. Hi. Then uh, we have Dr. Justin Osborne, is the director of the Market University Explorer Program and an international recruitment specialist. He received his MA from Arizona State University and his PhD from Beijing Normal University. So I welcome you today. Great. And lastly, we have uh, Mr. Jitin Chavla, who, has an, who is an MBA graduate from one of the top most business institutes of India, Faculty of Management Studies, University of Delhi. Mr. Jitin Chavla is the founder and director of North India's topmost career counseling, aptitude testing, and profile building and study abroad firm from last 21 years. He has been doing a number of TV shows on NDTV, CNN, IBN, Delhi Ajtak, Headlines Today, Doordarshan, and writes for various newspapers and magazines like the India Today, Aspire, Outlook, HT, Dainik Bhaskar, Amar Ujala, Hindustan Hindi, Dainik Jagran, and Times of India. He has been answering students' queries on your 102.6 FM and radio also. Uh, I welcome you, sir. So um, just, uh, just a heads up, end to uh, ask your questions. And then uh, towards the end, if anybody has any questions, we can take up. And so is, uh, the platform is all yours. Oh. Uh, I think, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody else can hear, but I can't. Just want to. Oh, I think I was, I was on a mute. Okay. So, I didn't know uh, if it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so I was just sharing that. Uh, it's great to have all of you here with, uh, with us and uh, I'm sure students uh, in India and from other places, wherever they've joined us, uh, you know, they would uh, get great ideas about understanding how do you build up a profile at whatever ages you might be uh, at and also how do you look at universities, how do you plan out your entire education journey, how can you make it more exciting, enriching as well as uh, get a lot of value which you can showcase to the universities and get into top universities in the world. So I'll invite Michael to start the session and uh, start sharing. All right. Thank you so much for having me today. I really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in active discussion uh, with these students uh, from across many regions of the world and with other educators as well. So thank you very much for the invitation. And I am going to begin sharing my screen. Or I can add from a uh, couple slides. Google slides. Am I able to share my screen from my end? Uh, or do I have to add the file after I download it? Uh, I think uh, you can click on uh, share and share screen. I have share and then it's okay. There we go. Your screen. And Sorry, I missed that the first time. All right. Okay. Window. Which one? There we go. Okay. Okay, I need to. I guess I need to change my system preferences to do that. I appreciate everyone's patience. I hope everyone's doing very well today. Okay. Okay. All right, let's try one more time. There we 
go. This should work. All right. There we go. I think that's that is the that is the look of success there. Okay, so everybody can see my screen clearly, I'm hoping. If not, tell me. <laughs> and then I can try to make the proper adjustments. So um, once again, uh, my name is Michael Stomps. I'm the International Director for iPark Academy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody today uh, to share a little bit of insight about academic profile development, a very broad category, of course, um, lots of ins and outs and very individualized because it's going to vary widely about what's going to be the best opportunity uh, for you to, yes? Sorry, Michael, uh, we, we are still seeing a gray screen. I think, uh, can you click on next? Or something? Uh, uh, the gray again, screen. can you click on uh, slideshow? I did, yeah, I, I clicked on slideshow. I can see it on my side as well. Uh, I can but see we, the we, are, we can see the uh, Chrome tab. Just the Chrome but, tab? Yeah, just the Chrome tab. Oh, okay. So can you again again click on uh, share screen? Yeah, let's try that one more time. Or, yeah, let's do this. Share screen. Yes. Then Chrome tab, and then you can select the slides one and then share. Stop screen, share, share screen, and then the tab. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. Mm, oh my goodness. Here, let me just use this. I'll have to log okay, in with it, my account. Uh, let, let's uh, do one thing. If you can just mail Ribu, he'll put it on. And uh, meanwhile, we just start discussing the uh, basic uh, stuff. Yeah. Sure. Um, so let me, uh, oh, let's see. Um, I can see a student, Shubham. Hi, Shubham. Yeah. So, Shubham, you can uh, share anything if you want to share right now. I can see a lot of highs you're doing. Okay. Hi, Tanesh. So, Tanesh, Shubham, I'm sure you have come to understand. So, we're just taking a minute to start some, this thing with the, the technology, I would say. Uh, so, uh, meanwhile, hi, Aditi. I think a lot of you are quite regulars. So, uh, uh, just to just to kick start, you know, uh, first thing about profile development is not by looking at activities, not by looking at the external world, but by understanding you yourself. Yeah. So, as a rookie career counselor, when I started, I can see a lot of other people joining in. Uh, Aradhya Sina, welcome. Anita Rahecha, good evening. Gaurav Gaming, hi. I can see a lot of people who have joined us. So, uh, is this working now? Uh, no. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> it says uh, it I shows can, it's working on my side. Okay. I can, you can just send it to me or Ribu and we'll just take care of it. I'll just it. send it over. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, some extra excitement for everybody today. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll share it with you right no, now. No, now it is on. Now it is on. It is on now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can see it now? Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I start the slideshow. You can see it still? Just just click next. Next. It I, It's on the screen now. I'm getting academic profile enhancement and how do you distinguish yourself? In yes. Yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> Amazing. Congrats. That's oh, my great. gosh. You. All right. Yeah. So this is a lesson for everybody that, you know, persistence and innovation can get you through any trial whatsoever. So ah, that's this, amazing. <laughs> it's a very it's a very exciting start to our even more exciting discussion today. I promise you that. So um, 
as I was discussing previously, academic profile enhancement. So as the title indicates, it's all about distinguishing yourself um, in a increasingly competitive college admissions environment. So um, as you all may know, um, since COVID, um, actually it has gotten more competitive to get into top tier level universities compared to prior to COVID. Most people didn't really think that was going to happen, um, but that's the world that we're living in now. Uh, more students from across the world are looking for more options for universities. Um, so they're applying to dozens of them. Um, and that means that there might, they might be looking in multiple countries, multiple parts of America, multiple parts of Europe um, in order to consider uh, for admission. So that means that it's our, it's our task um, as counselors and it's our tasks um, as competitive high school uh, students looking to go to top level universities to distinguish ourselves in whatever way we can. So the big question is, how do you do that? Um, you know, how do you find the right opportunity for you that's going to uh, get you to that next level, not just to get you to have the right relevant experiences to make you a competitive applicant, but then also how do you demonstrate that qualification um, as well um, to an admissions committee that, you know, maybe only has a few moments to take a look at your application and make a decision as to whether they want to continue reviewing your application or just send it to the waitlist pile or to the decline pile. Um, so I do want to have a active discussion today as much as we can so people can make comments or ask questions um, at any time. Um, but I do want feedback as much as possible throughout. So first thing to look at is what does make you unique? Um, and I want everybody to kind of think about that. So do we know ourselves well enough to think, what is my biggest strong suit? Where is my area of strength? And maybe where's my area of weakness as well? Um, many people honestly do not really fully know that answer, um, especially um, when you're still you know, developing as a person um, in high school. I didn't know really who I was very well back when I was in high school many, many eons ago. Um, and that's okay. Um, if you're not quite sure what you think your biggest strength is, ask some of your really close friends, ask your family members. They are the ones who will actually definitely know for sure. Um, and it might be something that you don't really fully expect. So um, I don't know if we're able to share or see if anybody knows exactly what makes them unique. Um, are people able to come on screen or are people able to make comments about, um, you know, in the comment section, because I can't see the comments right now because I'm in my, my presentation. But uh, if somebody has a comment yes. about, yeah. Yes, uh, students can comment. So we have received a comment from Aditi. So she is asking, will you be discussing commerce based careers, profile building and upcoming fields in commerce? So I think the uh, question is that how a commerce students can build a profile. Sure. It, I think it depends on what type of program you're looking at. Um, so first off, if anybody wants to put in the comments what they think their area of strength is, or if they know um, or have maybe a close friend where they can see where their areas of strength are, that's a good starting off point for discussion. Um, but for commerce, I think what you're going to look at is a university that has really great connections um, in the commerce field. So you're going to be looking for um, a university that will have maybe supply chain experience or uh, experience with world markets. I'm assuming that when they're discussing commerce, it's maybe like international um, commerce, maybe world trade, economics, something similar to that. Um, and what you have to think about with your profile is what is an experience that I can participate in that will have something to do with commerce or international trade or business that is easy for me to show and prove that I did a worthwhile experience? And you know, how do I convey that? How do I take advantage of it? And when you think about it, that's kind of a difficult task because many people don't have an opportunity to say, you know, work with other international companies when they're in high school or doing an internship with you know, companies participating in international trade abroad. Um, so, that's one of those things where you have to think about what opportunities do I have locally? Um, so it's not as much of a research based field as it is maybe a practical experience field. 
So what I would encourage students to do is maybe, um, ev even if they can't get paid for it, try to get some type of internship or unpaid position at maybe a commerce, a, a company that works in global commerce or a company that works in global economics or business, um, a major company, and then also work your way in. Once you're in there um, and you're able to prove yourself um, and, and work um, at any level really um, and get some network connections, that can be something that's really beneficial for you. That's something you can put maybe on your resume that you work for this amount of time um, in this position at this major organization. It was a volunteer position. I did you know, work in this area. I learned a lot about these things in particular. Um, and then having maybe a nice letter of recommendation from somebody from that organization could be helpful too. Um, that's one thing I think would be beneficial. If you did want to go maybe the more global economics route and you did want to do say, maybe some research on that, you could do um, independent research um, as well. Um, and then if you are so inclined, maybe get research published. That's an easy way in order for your uh, in order for your experience to really be validated. Um, because, you know, sometimes the issue is not finding the experience, but finding a way for universities to instantly recognize the value. So, you know, I can say I worked 500 hours of volunteering at this organization. And that's a lot, but it doesn't tell you anything about what that experience did for me, what I actually did there and how it was valuable. So that's really the big challenge. Um, and having a very well-recognized opportunity that you took advantage of or well-recognized organization you work with um, and a clear explanation of how that was valuable is really important. Um, so that's what I would say. But in the beginning, even before we even started talking about profilement, I do want to emphasize that academics are still the most important thing. So having the most excellent extracurricular opportunities or profile enhancement opportunities doesn't really matter if you got all you know below average or average grades um, at the top level universities because you know the Ivy Leagues can be uh, choosy and they know that so automatically actually at the beginning of the process they get way more applicants than they can handle. So they will automatically screen out a lot of students at the very beginning that don't meet certain metrics. Um, and if you have grades that are weak, you will probably be automatically screened out at the beginning. You won't even get the opportunity for someone to take a look at your file. So your academics are the most important. You never want to pursue a profile enhancement opportunity uh, to the detriment of your grades. So always keep that in mind. Um, you know, don't overstretch yourself. It's better to do a couple things really, really well than to do 10 or 20 things poorly or, you know, meaty, meet in the middle of the road and not do them excellently. So keep that in mind. Um, are there any additional comments? I, I can't see the screen, so uh, I can't check for myself. Or are there no comments as of now? So there are comments, so uh, more comments are coming, say, for careers. So I think we will answer them uh, shortly after one in our discussions. Sure. So any queries you have, guys, with re which relates to developing profile. So like uh, we got one query uh, that is from Shruti. So how to get an internship as a class, grade 11 student? So you can get an internship at any age. Um, you just need to be willing to take the initiative in order to do that. So um, it's easy, of course, if you have maybe like an uncle or a relative in a major company uh, to get some type of internship, uh, whether paid or unpaid um, at a company or organization. Uh, you know, we all wish that we had those types of family connections, right? Um, but assuming that you don't, then it's your job in order to put yourself out there um, and introduce yourself to the organization and just offer yourself wherever it's needed. So um, many types of organizations, depending on what you want to get into, will have some type of youth development program or youth development opportunities. Um, 
But if you want to get some type of hands-on experience, maybe during the summertime when you have the most uh, availability, I would highly encourage independently reaching out to them. If they have a, maybe a location in person where you are, that's maybe the best way because it's easy for them to, you know, nobody will work harder for you than you. So, um, you know, you can send emails, you can call, um, but there's no replacement for being there in person if you can. So if you want to go to an organization, say volunteer or um, be in, in some type of role or working position there, it'll probably be unpaid. I'm just warning everybody. Um, so you have to volunteer your time. Um, but uh, if you're willing to do that, you're willing to take the initiative, um, it becomes very difficult in order to say no to someone who is so eager to make a difference in that field and is so eager to participate um, in that organization and give their time for free. Uh, so you can typically have a breakthrough there. Um, but that's that's what I would that's the type of advice I would give is as as much that you can distinguish yourself as possible. Usually that's by going in person if you can. So the next question is from Bhavna Sarmaha. So uh, she wants to ask how important is profile building and if she scores say about 90% in her academics have, and have no exposure in extracurricular. So will she be able to get into a top university? Well, um, I think extra, you know, profile enhancement is the factor that will that will determine if you get into the very top level universities. Now, what she's mentioning, having strong grades, maybe a strong SAT score as well, um, that will get you into some good universities for sure. Um, but when you're looking at the very top level, maybe like top 30, um, you really have to have something else too. You must have it because just think about the position that an admissions counselor has um, at Harvard, for example, where they have tens of thousands of applicants every year. So, you know, do you think that of the tens of thousands of applicants that you are going to be among the, you know, couple thousand or so that have the very best academics and the very best experiences of all of those tens of thousands of students if you have no profile enhancement opportunities at all? Probably not. Um, you know, that's one of those things where you want to make a college admissions counselor stop and look at an opportunity that you've listed on your resume and, and think, oh, wow, like, that's different. I haven't seen that. Because you look at files, you know, one after the other, everybody has perfect test scores and perfect grades and great opportunities. But what is something you can do that's different from most people? And that's really what you have to fine and that's what's going to be a little bit different for everyone else depending on what your passion is so the that's the long way of saying it's in incredibly important you must have it in order to get into the very top level universities so uh so gautami shetty has shared uh, one of her strength is communications leadership innovative ideas and uh, helping people find solutions more lenient towards social work and psychology. Okay, well, that's great. So then let's think about, you know, what opportunities would be helpful for that. So if you have great communication ability, um, you know, you're interested in psychology, communications, leadership, um, right away, I'm thinking, you know, student government, um, if you have something like that, putting yourself out there to be a leader, um, whether that's in like a model UN um, or whether that's in, um, you know, class rep representation, um, it's, I don't know how popular that is abroad, but it's very popular um, in the United States. I was actually, not to brag, I was our student body president in my 12th grade year. So I know a little bit about that. Um, there's also really common government level simulations similar to Model UN that you can participate in as well. Um, and that's something that can help not just show your leadership, but demonstrate it too, because anybody can say I'm a leader, but not everybody can list concrete experiences of when they were a leader and how that was different and unique um, and really demonstrated their ability. 
Um, so, you know, maybe take the opportunity to be your team lead um, during your next major project or your next extracurricular opportunity. Um, and keep that in mind that the lessons you learned and what you did and what you achieved there, um, you're taking ownership of that. Um, so if you win your competition or you win at some type of um, contest or, you know, some type of, uh, you know, STEM opportunity or a collaboration opportunity, that's something that you can say, I was the team lead on that. Um, we won this competition, it was nationwide or it was regional, and you can explain, um, you know, why that was a beneficial opportunity, and that's something that demonstrates it. Uh, thanks, uh, Michael. So we would now like to, you know, proceed ahead with the PPT you have, and then if we have questions and we can, you know, take in between and uh, well, share, great. get your reviews. Well, awesome. So yes, so we did uh, kind of cover, you know, different areas. Um, another area that can be sometimes, um, I think I would say less common, but also important is athletics. So, um, you know, you will notice that some elite level universities, like, uh, I think the best example might be Stanford. Um, you know, they will give, you know, admission to many of the top level athletes um, who attend, even if they might not otherwise qualify <laughs> for admission. So even a super, you know, if, if you're super strong in one area um, and you're at the top level in one area, uh, whether that's math, whether that's English, whether that's athletics um, or some other opportunity, that's something that could be enough for you in order to uh, gain admission. Um, and honestly, it is better to show strength in, in one specific area at the highest level um, and, and not have as strong other areas than it is to have kind of middle of the road credentials across the board. Um, it it's, tends to be looked on more favorably if you're very strong in one particular area. Um, so again, how do you how do you represent these uh, these types of credentials to universities? So it can be awards, contests, publications, um, academics. So AP, IB, or college credit courses, standardized so, testing as well. Uh, Michael, uh, we uh, we can't see the transition in these slides. Uh, is there anything else apart from academic profile enhancement slide that are that you're sharing? There's, there's a few more. Yeah. So I'm yes. Can I'm you do that we can check that things. Yeah, can you see? Can you see the next slide now? No. You can't? No. I can see the next slide. Oh no. Here. Let's take a look. Oh, okay. I think I know what's happening. All yeah. right, there we go. So there we have introduction. And gotcha, all. gotcha. Okay, so I had to close it and open it again. So the introduction. So as uh, as we were discussing, what does make you unique? We went over some of those. People are listing some examples of that in their um, in the comments section, which I appreciate that we have discussed. Um, and then finally, how do you represent these to universities? Um, there are multiple ways. Um, one thing I would say is, you know, many universities are not asking for standardized test scores at this point, which is great for lots of students. I mean, who, if we can avoid the SAT, why not? However, I will say, if you know you're a strong test taker and you're, uh, you're able to perform well on those, uh, those types of exams, I would highly encourage you to submit a strong SAT score because that will help you a lot, especially um, maybe you're really high level in math. Um, and if you score, you know, 780 on your math section or a perfect score on your math section, that is something that can help make the difference for you, um, especially if you're looking into some type of math or engineering field. But again, if you're a poor test taker, you can avoid that. <laughs> you can possibly, you know, you don't have to take the standardized test, but if you know that that's a strength, definitely exploit it. Um, so uh, what is the purpose of our education now in the 21st century? Um, well, it's, overall, it's comprehensive. So um, the definition of what a quality education is keeps expanding day by day. Um, different opportunities keep uh, 
presenting themselves day by day, um, especially now. Um, one of, I guess, the positives of um, you know the pandemic is that people are exploring new options that are online. You know, we're doing this session uh, fully online from multiple different countries across the world, um, and we're able to all participate and collaborate together. There are more and more opportunities like that that you can explore. Um, so, of course, you want to enhance your abilities. You want to enhance what you already have. Um, but then you also want to be able to demonstrate that in a concrete way um, it, it externally. So that external performance aspect has to be really clear as well, whether that's a research publication, a test score, an award, a leadership opportunity or a leadership position, um, something that shows that you, you not only have the ability, but you've used it as well. Um, so career opportunities, if you know the industry you want to get into, you know you want to go into medicine, um, I would strongly encourage you to you know, volunteer at some type of medical clinic. Um, if you're into engineering, science, you want to do research, I would highly encourage you to already step into that research field if that's an interest. Um, and make sure that you not only have a way of demonstrating that skill, but a way of representing it easily to the to uh, your prospective universities. Um, I did want to mention that we do have, as an organization, IPERC, a really um, strong extracurricular opportunity to build your profile. Um, it's iStar Research. Um, it's fully online. Um, it's around 10 weeks. Um, and this is in partnership with uh, professors from Ivy League institutions or top 30 um, institutions. Um, so they're all from top 30 ranked university um, universities here. Um, and you work with that professor in a small group in order to complete your own independent research project, um, all online around 10 weeks in total. And then at the end of that opportunity, you receive university credit, um, you receive a fully published um, certificate. So it will be published in a scientific journal. Um, and best of all, you don't need any previous research experience to participate in that. Um, you would have to apply, um, so you can ask um, our colleagues at Jitin Shaola about information about that, um, if you're interested in applying for January intake. Um, but this is a great opportunity where it's very easy to show, this is what I did. I did research with this professor from Yale or Princeton or Harvard, and this is my publication. Um, and here you can look up my published paper whenever you want. Here's the information on publication. So that's a really clear way in order to demonstrate um, your proficiency in a particular area. Um, and the letter of recommendation from the Ivy League professor doesn't hurt either. So uh, great opportunities there. Um, brief matriculation statistics for this program as well. So um, many top level universities. So we were, we've been really proud of the the success that students have achieved in a program like this. And it goes to show that background enhancement and academic profile enhancement does make a huge difference. Um, it can be, in fact, the difference between admission and maybe a wait list, um, some really key opportunities. So just visualized. So what we've kind of discussed today, um, this is what your path to top level universities will look like. Most important thing is still your academics. Make sure that whatever you do, you don't harm your academics in the process. So um, if you have to do so much work for one or two opportunities that your grades really suffer during your 11th grade year, it's not worth it. It really, it really doesn't matter how great that opportunity is. Um, if it's making your grades suffer, um, you know, that's going to take you out of contention anyhow for the very top levels. So make sure that that is a priority. Um, I would highly encourage dual enrollment, IB, AP, college level programs, because um, unlike, you know, honors level classes, AP, IB, and university level courses have very clear criteria and a very standardized curriculum that is very well recognized by universities. Um, so in an honors program at a high school, uh, you know, that can mean anything. There's no standardized curriculum, but for those programs, AP, IB, and dual enrollment, there is. So that adds a lot of weight. Um, doing that profile enhancement as well, very important. Research paper publication, academic awards, 
leadership opportunities, internships. Um, again, try to make those as well recognized as possible. Um, because keep in mind that for each opportunity you have, you have maybe like a sentence or two to really make your big impact. Um, and that's your opportunity to make that admissions counselor want to read more into your file and you want them to do that. Uh, strong re recommendation letters, um, in addition, very, very important as well. Um, something that can make an important difference in your application file. Um, however, those will follow after you've done your strong academic work and after you've uh, taken advantage of those profile enhancement opportunities. So as long as you perform strongly there, um, the strong recommendation letters will follow. Um, you know, your, your teachers um, will be able to definitely see, your professors will see how strong of a student that you are, and they will be able to share that. All right, so in conclusion here, um, so just to, I'll take questions after this as well. I know we're a little bit over time, but uh, I'm very open to taking any questions we have. Um, so overall, priority is your academic performance. Um, so over 90% of university admissions counselors, they look at college level curriculum and grades in their college level coursework as the highest priority first. So not much else matters after that, you know, if grades are low. So make sure that those are all in order. Um, upward trajectory, though, I will say super, super important. So don't feel like it's all over for you if maybe in ninth grade you didn't do so well, um, or you know maybe you had one rough semester. Um, don't feel like, okay, like I can't even try. That's not the case at all. If you're showing a steady upward trajectory in your grades, that's really a very important thing because of course, your grades that are recent are going to be more representative of your ability than grades from 10th grade or ninth grade. Um, you know, it, it, it just makes sense. And you've demonstrated a strong ability to perform well if you've done that. So keep that in mind too. And um, similarly, downward trajectory negatively impacts your application. So ninth and 10th grade grades are perfect, but 11th grade grades are bad. That's no good. <laughs> That's not going to work very well for you. Um, of course, discover some of your talents and explore them to the fullest. This will be different for each individual. Um, it'll be slightly, uh, slightly customized based off of what field that you're interested in. A lot of people don't know what they're interested in, and that's great. Um, that discovery process of finding what you're passionate about um, can lead to any number of opportunities as well. Um, so, you know, what I would say is take advantage of any opportunities that you find. Um, even if you're not sure exactly what you want to go into um, 100% or you're exploring different things, make sure that you're taking advantage of worthwhile opportunities while you explore, because you can still list those on your resume. Um, you know, Even if you did an internship or two and you're, you're not going to pursue that field, it's still a valuable experience and it's still something that you should list on a resume. And then be mindful of your workload. Um, it's okay to limit your extracurriculars if your prior commitments and grades uh, will benefit, um, but keep that in mind. I, and also keep in mind too that it's incredibly competitive to get into, you know, Ivy League institutions, the top 20, top 30 level institutions. So, um, and it's not the best fit for everybody either. So it's okay if you discover that this is too much for me. Like I can't take you know, all of these college level classes and take all of these profile enhancement opportunities all at once. Like it's overwhelming. There's no possible way that I could do any of that and be a healthy person. That's fine. Like you don't, it, it's not the end of the world. If, you know, an Ivy league is not for you for an undergraduate level. Um, there's always more opportunities later. You never know what will happen. Um, you may end up going to a high level university for graduate school um, or an opportunity may present itself at a later time that gives you the ability to enroll at that dream university. But it is not all determined based off of your undergraduate admission. Um, and just keep that in mind, too. So there's there's a, a lot of perspective there and you have a long life ahead of you. So there's plenty of time to take advantage of more opportunities in the future. Okay.
do we have any uh, additional comments here? So, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, so, we, we have got one question from Anshika Bunsal. If we want to do economic honors, then what should be the important for profile building? So, first off, I mean, honor, you know, any honors class is great. Or are they talking about honors, like the major, they're going to go into the honors program at the university? I'll just, I'll cover both. Um, so, first off, on honors classes in high school are great, um, but anything that's AP or IB or anything that awards college credit is better. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's no standardized honors curriculum across the world. There is a standardized level for college credit, for an IB program, and for an AP program. So keep that in mind. If you can take an AP class or an IB class, that's better. Um, for profile enhancement opportunities and economics, um, it depends on what you want to pursue. So do you want to do um, global trade? Do you want to do domestic economics? Um, in the United States, we have something called like the Chamber of Commerce. There's a lot of branches across the United States in different cities. Um, if you have something similar to that in your local area, your local like business advocacy organization, that would be a great start because the only purpose really of a company or an organization like Chamber of Commerce is business development. So see if you can get an opportunity with an organization like that. Um, that's something that I would recommend. Um, if you're interested in, in business. Great. So uh, thank you, Michael. So if you get any more questions, I will uh, put you on screen and ask. So uh, Justin, we are ready to uh, start off with your part. There we go. All right, there we go. I got myself unmuted. All right, can everybody see me now? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's see. Understand. Let's see if I can get this share part taken care of a little bit easier. All right, share screen. Window. All right, can we see my screen? Yes or no? Uh, what's you... Yes, we can see your screen. Can you put it on a slideshow mode? All right, I have it on slideshow. Is it moving? Uh, no. Oh, really? It worked before. Uh, Michael, what did you do? How did you fix that issue? So, uh, click on slideshow. All right. Uh, I click share. I'm going to share screen. Share click screen. On uh, yeah. I'm going to window. Windows, yeah, window tab and then tab. I'm clicking build my presentation. I'm clicking share. And you see my, do you see my screen? So we can see the screen, yeah. So... Okay, uh, I'm going to click on yeah, slide. Uh, is it changing? Uh, one sec. I think it has yet not gone on a slideshow mode. It's on slideshow mode on mine, so it's not moving. Is that what you're saying? It's not moving, yeah. But I think you can come out of slideshow and show so the things are, you... are visible. Well, how, how did Michael fix his? So, uh, so you can, you know, uh, well, so, yeah, you can, you know, don't uh, come out of that slideshow window, uh, come to, uh, the browser and then from there share that slideshow. So right, right here, you can see my screen, right? Yeah, yes, we no. can see your screen. Yes. So we okay. can see, yeah, I can see your screen. Is the, are the slides moving right now? Yeah. Yeah. The slides are moving. Yeah. Okay, so I just don't do the slideshow. I just do it like this, right? Yeah, we can do it like this, yes. Okay. All right. Well, sorry about that. But uh, anyways, thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jitan uh, Chalo, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Justin Osborne. I actually had the great pleasure to visit your wonderful country back in March. Uh, it was a really wonderful experience. I, I, I met uh, Mr. Chawla uh, and I, I met several great people in India and it was really wonderful. So uh, I really appreciate uh, that opportunity and the hospitality I received there. So I'm gonna be talking about building university experience. Now, uh, Michael talked about profile development. I'm talking about building university experiences. So there's a, 
some similarities there, but uh, hopefully I will present a unique perspective and you'll be able to get something out of both of our presentations today. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Marquette University. Uh, I wonder how many of you have ever heard of Marquette University. You can type in the chat, one, if you've heard of it, two, if you haven't ever heard of it. Uh, I'll be interested to see how many people have ever heard of Marquette University. But uh, Marquette is located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee is the largest city in the state of Wisconsin. It's a uh, top 30 metropolitan area in the United States. Um, it's a city that has traditionally been known as a brewing city. Uh, our baseball team is called the Brewers. So uh, beer is a famous thing here and also cheese. Uh, this whole area is very famous for their dairy. So the kind of cuisines from Milwaukee are the beer and cheese. Um, but these days, it's kind of known more for its basketball. We have the former NBA champions, Milwaukee Bucks, really great basketball team, always very good. So they're very popular throughout the city and throughout the country. This is the arena where they play, and it's actually the same place where Marquette plays their basketball. So basketball, both at Marquette and Milwaukee, is a really huge thing in the city and the university, something our students really love to attend is basketball. Um, now, Marquette was founded back in 1881. You can see the location here. So we, uh, even though we're in the Midwest, still kind of a beach city because we're right on Lake Michigan. And there are very, very beautiful beaches in Milwaukee. And it's just about an hour and a half north of Chicago, Illinois. So you get the, the big city of Milwaukee, and then you get the, the really big city of Chicago, which is the third biggest city in the United States. So, uh, Justin, we have got one question from Saurabh. So he wants to ask, is work experience mandatory for pursuing MBA in U.S. post a four-year degree? Um, that's it, it may be at some universities. Some universities might have that. Uh, most universities, I will say, no, they don't. It is not a, a requirement, although it is for some. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, feel free to ask more questions. I'll, I'll just stop me if you want me to take any questions. Uh, I'll show you. Here's our campus. Uh, on the left is the residential side. So we have a downtown campus very close to Lake Michigan. We have all the different programs that students might want to cover. We have the big ones for our international students are business administration and engineering. Uh, we're overall ranked number 83 uh, in the country. We also have a very high employment rate. So we're ranked number six in the country for employment. So it's really easy for our students to get a job right out of graduation. Uh, we also have really great teachers. We're ranked high for teaching. We're considered an innovative school because we do so many special programs and a, a best value school. So you, what you pay for a Marquette degree versus what it means on the market, it's a really great thing. Um, we do so much for employment. Uh, we have that really high ranking because of all the things that we do. So we really promote internships. Uh, about 76% of students do an internship. We have great relationships with industry in Milwaukee and Chicago. So there's a lot of job opportunities for the students. And we, uh, Marquette also has co-ops. So students can work and get credit for it uh, if they're in the engineering program. So it's really all of these things make Marquette the number six university in the country for employment. And these are just our highest ranked programs. So real estate is quite high. Supply chain management is a really big one. So this area, uh, the Milwaukee, Chicago area, has always been a hub for supply chain. So that's a great one. Uh, I'll mention our finance program because someone mentioned they're interested in, in business and finance earlier. So uh, our finance program is ranked 24th in the country. Uh, there's a huge alumni network for Marquette, especially on Wall Street. The, the alumni network on Wall Street is called the ins and outs of Wall Street. Uh, and students actually take a trip to Wall Street every year. And uh, if you're in the finance program, you actually get to start investing while you're in the program. About $2.6 million of the university endowment is in, invested by the finance program. Uh, and then we also have some engineering programs that are pretty highly ranked, like biomedical engineering, environmental engineering. There's also computer engineering, uh, civil engineering, construction engineering, electrical engineering, all the engineering. Um, there's a total of 13 STEM designated programs at Marquette. So I know that's important to do STEM programs because if you do the STEM, you can extend your OPT. You can stay and work in the country for a total of three years instead of just one if you don't do a STEM major. So there are 13 STEM designated majors at Marquette, mostly in the engineering department, but there's a couple of the more business related STEM programs like applied economics, applied accounting, accounting analytics, that kind of thing. All right. So I, uh, because I couldn't show the slideshow, it's not going to sh show things exactly how I wanted it. But anyway, so you already know the answers to my questions before I ask them. But anyway, so um, we're going to talk about building university experience. So firstly, why is that important to build university 
experience, uh, really uh, because it affects your admission, uh, right? The university will certainly look at what type of experience you have in the, in the past, and they'll use that to base their decision on whether or not to admit you. And it also has an effect on your scholarship. Okay, I know scholarship can be very, very important to some students, especially in the USA, where education tends to be a little bit more expensive than in other countries. So scholarships are definitely impacted as well uh, by the type of university experience that a student has. So the reason it affects your admission decision is that a university representative is really the ideal student for them, is a student that has motivation, determination, and passion for what they want to study. So somebody who has already pushed themselves to do the type of things that they would do in the university, someone who has that experience. So the, we, we say the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior right so the admission representatives are always going to be looking at what has the student done in the past and they will base a lot of their decision on what you've done so if you want to get into an ivy league university or if you want to get into just a very good university or you want to get a really big scholarship you need to have a lot of uh, university experience and we'll talk about the different kinds of experience that you can have and the other reason is the scholarship Right. So I know scholarship, probably a lot of you out there with nobody would turn down a scholarship. Right. So uh, what I have here. So universities, when they make their scholarship decisions, they make them on a wide range of factors. So a lot of universities, they don't have exactly a rubric that says this is exactly how you get a scholarship. And if they do have a rubric, they probably don't make it public for you to see. So how do you get a good scholarship? Um, now, Marquette, they don't make their scholarship rubric public. So this is not the actual scholarship application rubric for, uh, for Marquette. But it is a, a rubric that I just wanted to have let you have a look at and, and go over a little bit. So if you see, I don't know how clearly you can see it, but if you see the top there, uh, well, this is a 100-point system. Unless you're in arts, then it's 125. But generally, it's a 100-point system. So grade point average is about 20 points of this. So about 20% they're saying is the grade point average that you have. I think that might be a little bit underestimating the importance of grades because as Michael mentioned previously, grades are really, really important to what you do. So this might be a little bit underestimated, but it, it, it's about there. It's around that. It's around 20%, 30%, maybe a quarter or a third of your overall scholarship is going to be determined by your grades. And as you'll see here, you basically have to have pretty good grades. You have to have above a, a 3.5 or above to get the full 20 points, uh, between a 2.99 and a 2.5 to get 10 points. If you have below a 2.55, you're not getting any points for academics. You're probably not even gonna get into any very good universities. At Marquette, you need about a 3.0 in order to get into the university. So, so really that's the grade point average that you need to have if you wanna get in or if you want to have any chance at a good scholarship. Now, the next two here, they kind of go together because they're both things that you have a lot of freedom to write about. So there's the personal statement and the, the essay. So the personal statement is you really, your you're freedom. You're free to tell them whatever you want for the most part. Uh, some have some prompts to prompt you, but for the most part, the personal statement, it, it, it's you. You write however you want. And then the essay, usually they give you some questions and you have to answer it. But with the essay, you can still kind of guide the, the reader to understand what you want them to understand. So even though they have an actual topic, you can still put in what you want. You just have to be smart about it. So when you're making your personal statement and your essay, you want to really impress the admissions representative. And so how do you do that? So I, I think that there are really three types of great students when you're talking about admission or when you're talking about giving them a scholarship. Okay, so there's the, the first type of student. Okay, so the first type of student is the type of student that has known what they wanted to do for a long time. Like they knew that they wanted to be a computer engineer from the time they were a kid. They loved computers. Oh, and, and they just kept doing that throughout high school. And then now they're applying to university. So this student would write an essay that says something like, I knew from the time I was very young that I wanted to be a computer engineer. I was taking apart my parents' computers from the time I was a kid and they would get mad at me, but they always supported me. And then I began working in computers, that kind of thing. Now, I know 
and many of you, you don't know what you want to do. And that's really common. You know, most, I would say probably even most students, even by the time they're applying for university, they don't have a clear picture in their head what they want to do. And that's okay. Yeah, that's totally fine. You can still get a great scholarship and get admitted without really knowing exactly what you want to do. But one of the best types of student is that kind of student that does know exactly what they want to do. And they've been working for it for a long time. Because if you're giving out a scholarship or if you're giving admission to a you know, very select number of students, you want to know that that investment is going to pay off. You're making an investment in that student. You're giving them money. So as I mentioned before, the best way to determine what they're going to do is what they've done in the past. So you look at their essay, their personal statement, their resume, and you see they've done all of this in computer engineering or whatever the field. You know that they're probably going to continue that and they're going to be a good investment. So I would say that is one of the top kinds, types of student is that kind of student who has known what they want to do for years and has always worked towards it. Uh, the second type of student is the one that they don't know exactly what they wanted to do, uh, but they've really motivated themselves and pushed themselves to do a lot of different things. So this is the student that's been involved in all kinds of activities. They play sports. They're on the debate team. They're, uh, they do after school charity work. They're involved in a lot of different clubs. They just do a lot of different things, right? They don't say, you know, I've been working towards this one specific thing for a long time, but I've really motivated myself and dedicated myself to a lot of different activities. So this is also a very safe investment, investment this kind of student, because you know they're, they're dedicated, you know they're willing to work hard, you know they can apply themselves to what they want and achieve things. So this type of student is, is really a great student, the student who has done a lot and tried a lot of things, even if they don't know exactly the thing they want to do. Okay, so the, the last type of student is the student that has overcome challenges. This is really important. Uh, so admissions representatives really eat up that, uh, you know, a student who has had difficulties, a student who had to overcome things, because we know that when students go to university, they are going to have challenges. It's not going to be just like high school, especially if you're going to a new country. It's going to be challenging. So the student that has had challenges in the past and overcome those challenges to achieve wh where they are and to be able to apply to a good university, that really means a lot. And that shows a lot to the admissions representative. So and, and it doesn't have to be a, a really major challenge. It could be a many different things. Just think about some challenge that you faced. It could be something major. It could be a family tragedy. It could be an illness in the family. It could be you know, something like that. I wouldn't go too depressing. I wouldn't, you know, make them cry in your, your statement if you can help it. But I would talk about some kind of challenge that you've had. Um, it, it could be, you know, you moved, you, uh, you had difficulty with math, uh, and you over overcame that. Whatever the challenge is, just talk about how you had that challenge, you overcame that challenge. And uh, by doing that, you were able to achieve and you're now in the position to attend this great university. So these are the really three uh, types of students. And I would encourage you could probably put yourself into one of those three. That last student was the one, you know, they didn't have all the opportunities. The first two students, they didn't have challenges, but they had a lot of opportunities and they, they took advantage of those opportunities. The third student, they didn't have a lot of opportunities, but they overcame the challenges. And, and both of these are very impressive. And if you can combine both of these into one, you know, I overcame a lot of challenges and I always knew I loved computer engineering from the time I was a kid. That is that's perfect right there. Right? That's really going to impress the admissions representative. And you're probably going to get a very, very good scholarship. So um, that's these things. Financial need also comes into that. Maybe that's one of the challenges, financial need. Uh, and then those extracurricular activities are also 15 percent. Honors and awards uh, are five points. Letters of recommendation are five points. Letters of recommendation, uh, you know, we don't expect a whole lot from the person that's going to be writing the letter. Just want to know that, that they've worked with you in the past in some way and will vouch for you. That's why, you know, that's only five points. If you're an art student, obviously there's a big component that is your art portfolio. But I will assume that most of you are not art students. You're just regular students. So if you look at this, 
academics is 20 percent and you know the rest of this are all things that you're doing outside of the class so when it comes to scholarship having outside of the classroom experience or even in the classroom experience is very very important um now at marquette marquette gives a very good scholarship now marquette's a private university so the tuition can be a little bit more expensive than a public university but we do offer very good scholarships so we would offer up to twenty seven thousand dollars if you have a gpa in the range of 3.5 and you can write a decent essay you're probably going to get that full amount of twenty seven thousand dollars if you're on the lower range of gpa you're probably looking at more um twenty thousand but you're going to get a half or more of your university education paid for most likely uh, if you did want to go to marquette and if you want to go to other universities um many private universities they don't offer quite as good scholarships as marquette probably but you can get very good scholarships if you apply yourself while you're still in high school and there's a lot of scholarships out there you probably don't never even heard of or you don't even know so just google this you can find a ton of scholarship for international students it may be through your university. It may be just a private scholarship or a government scholarship. There are a ton of scholarships, and I would definitely encourage you. You can get money by looking for extra scholarships. Okay, so I wanted to ask you all, what was the reason for building university? Uh, what is the purpose of a university? Okay, so just think about that a little bit. What is the actual purpose of a university education? Uh, you can already see my answers that I put here, uh, but uh, one is to get a job, right? Let's let's be real. Uh, people do this because they want to get a job and they want to support themselves in the future. That's why they go to university. Um, it's also learning how to learn, right? Because people have to know how to think critically. They have to know how to adapt. And this is one of the major purposes of university is to teach students how to learn and it's to just get through it just graduate, just finish and just get that certificate, that paper that you can put on your wall that shows I did this. Um, so these are the really uh, important things about atten attending university. And these are kind of what you want to think about as you go, you start to you know, try to build university experience. All right. So I, I think the career related experience is going to be the most important. Um, and, and the reason for that is, and Michael talked a lot about this, is just that it shows those people in admissions that you're serious, right? They, they don't want to give the, a, a valuable admission spot or a valuable scholarship to some student that might not be serious. And if you've done things in the past that show that you're, that you're working towards your, your career, they're going to accept you and they're going to give you a good scholarship. So career experience, I would say, is the most important. Now, some of the ways you can get this kind of experience, job shadowing, this is easy, easy, easy. Anybody can do this, right? It doesn't matter what kind of position you're in. If you if you go to a business and you say, hey, I'd just like to shadow you for a day or just like to, well, I won't get in your way. I won't bother you. I'll give you a hand if you need it. But I'd just like to shadow you. You don't have to pay me anything. You can get, you can, you can do that. Most people, I believe, will let you you do that if you go into a business and ask them. And that's great experience. That's great to have on your resume. That's great to talk about on your essay or your personal statement that you've had that experience. Internships is similar. Now, internships, you're doing, you're actually getting more into the business of doing the work. But also, if you're willing to do internships without pay, you're going to find somebody that's going to, to hire you to let you do it. And it doesn't matter if you want to do economics. There are so many different possibilities. You know, you can just go into any business because any business is related to economics. Uh, you can work behind the cash registers and just say, I, I did an internship at this business or I job shadowed this business. Um, you, you can go to a bank. I'm sure they'd be more than willing to help you. But there, there's a lot of different opportunities for job shadowing and internships. If you're willing to work without pay, there's somebody out there that's going to give you that opportunity. Also, service learning right so there's all types of activities volunteer work helping out in your community these are the type of things that we consider to be service learning and they really really care about in the united states if you're going to apply for admissions uh, to one of the elite universities especially you almost have to have some service learning so get out there in your community 
help out. It doesn't matter what it is. You can go out and pick up garbage. You can go out and help some the elderly in your community, volunteer for um, some helping the poor. Any type of service will be considered service learning, and that will be really valuable whenever you go to apply for a university. Um, and yeah, just try to get involved in as many things as you, you can, because as I mentioned, that one student who's been involved in a lot of things, that student really stands out and that student will get admitted. Now, learning how to learn is also important because when you're in high school, you may learn a certain way. But when you get to university, they expect you to learn differently. You have to do a lot of things in university in the United States that you might not have to do in high school. You'll probably have to present in front of a lot of people. You'll have to work in groups. Uh, you'll have to write essays. You have to do research papers. There's a lot of different things that you have to do in university. Um, so learning how to learn, how to think critically, um, how to adapt to new situations. These are the type of things that universities want to uh, instill in their students. And the reason for that is you have to be able to know these things just to get around in your daily life. And also because many of the students that go on to the workforce, they're not even going to be working in the jobs that they majored in. A lot of students, that's the case. Um, so, and especially since how fast technology changes, the jobs that we have today may not even be the jobs of the future. So you have to be able to ad adapt and think critically. So universities want to see that you've had the experience of doing that in the past. So this is what I consider learning how to learn experience. Um, and Michael mentioned some of these, but there's a lot of um, what we call advanced credit or advanced college credit programs. So these are, these are kind of courses that you can take while you're in high school, but they give you a college experience. So by the time you finish the, these courses, you will understand what it's like to actually you know, take a university course. You'll be doing a lot of those things that I mentioned. And at the end of it, you'll actually get the college credit from these courses. Uh, we have a question, uh, Justin. If right. you say we can take it right now. Sure, go for it. Uh, so Saurabh is asking with German language will B2 level have an added advantage to my profile for U.S. admission or visa? German? I would say yes. Um, I mean, German is not a language that's really commonly spoken in the U.S., of course. So basically, if you're studying a language in the U.S., the main ones are going to be Spanish or Chinese, German or French. German would, would be around there and then maybe number five or something. So that would stand out. Yeah, if you have especially some kind of examination that shows I can speak German at this level, that, that would stand out, definitely. But now you don't get credit. If you say you do an AP German, a lot of universities will not give you any credit for that. Um, so that's one issue is that you won't be able to get credit if you do an AP German, but it will help you stand out on your application, yes. Uh, so... Uh, uh... Like uh, for people who are applying for MBA, uh, again, Saurabh has been asking, is work experience mandatory or how do we look at work experience? Uh, yeah, work experience is not mandatory, but it's it's very important, you know, definitely whenever you're, you're applying for an MBA. Um, because, you know, at a lot of universities, it is mandated. You do have to have a year of working experience. Now, that's usually the executive MBA. Um, you know, where, where work is it's more work related. But with the normal MBA, for most universities, you don't have to have it, but it definitely helps. And if you're a student that has, uh, if there's two students, one of them just has the academics and one of them has the academics and the work experience, the work experience is going to get the nod in terms of admission and scholarships, for sure. Okay, great, great. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, one of one student uh, who's pursuing architecture, she just visited our office and she was also trying to understand that how can she build up, uh, she's pursuing architecture, sorry. So, like she's in third year and how does she build up step by step on architecture? Uh, I mean, what kind of things she can do so that she gets good admits in masters in architecture or masters in urban planning kind of courses? Oh, okay. So she's in year three of undergraduate and wants to go do the master's, right? Okay. So, yeah. So what, what I would do, if it was me, I would Google 
um, you know, construction companies or architecture companies, uh, civil engineering companies, uh, find some of the major ones in your area, start with an email, find out who the, the major, you know, the, a manager, if they have a public relations person, that's probably the best person to deal with, but probably a lot of them don't. So I would just connect with some kind of manager, tell them that you want to do job, start out with job shadow because that's pretty simple, right? Job shadowing just means you're following around somebody who works at a job, who does a particular job that you want to do, and you're just kind of watching them just to see what they do on a normal basis. You don't even have to do this a lot. You can do this just a few times to get a good understanding of what they do. I would recommend doing it more, but uh, I would just email them or call them. If you, if you can't reach anybody, go into their office and just tell them that you want to do that. Uh, I, I know here in the U.S., there are a lot of the companies would be very amenable to that. I would assume in India, given my experience about how hospitable the people were, they would also allow you to do that. So I would just go in and say you want a job shadow, follow somebody around for a couple of days, get to know people. You know, networking is so important. Whenever you're there and you're doing the job shadowing, introduce yourself to everybody, be nice to everybody, because you know, networking, knowing people is as important as any type of experience. That would be great for you to get to know those people. Then possibly you could turn that job shadowing into an internship and tell them that you'll work for them for a few hours a week for free or if they want to pay you even better. But, uh, you know, at least if the only way you can do it is to work for free, tell them you'll work for free and then you'll have work experience. And that will definitely help you whenever you do go to apply for the master's. And you'll have the experience of knowing people in a company. And when you finish, there's somebody that might give you a job there's somebody that also will might write you a letter of recommendation for your master's program which it really means a lot to have a letter of recommendation from somebody in the industry uh, that's very important so yeah start with j just communicate just connect with people don't be afraid to put yourself out there you might have to ask 10 different companies before somebody says yes but eventually you'll find someone that will allow you to job shadow and then do an internship and maybe even pay you Great. Great. Please, please carry on. Please okay. okay. So I was talking about um, advanced credit programs. There are, I've only listed three here. Now there's also A levels. So A levels, maybe some of you are taking the A levels. A levels is uh, a US or excuse me, a UK type of, of educational system. So that works best if you plan to go to the, the UK for your education, taking A levels. A lot of universities in the US they will accept A-levels as college credit, but they don't maybe have a clear policy about how it's accepted in the same ways they do for the other types of advanced credit programs. So if you want to go to the UK, I would look at A-levels type of, of credit programs you can take. But if you want to go to the US, you're looking more at AP, IB, or what I would most recommend is dual enrollment. So AP, I, uh, Mark, uh, Michael mentioned AP. I'm sure most of you have probably heard AP. Some of you are probably doing AP, but AP is based on the U.S. and Canadian education system. Excuse me. Um, it was created by the College Board, uh, which is a major uh, educational organization in the United States. And it is essentially a college credit program that you're taking in high school. Uh, basically, you take a course and you need to take an exam for that course at the end of the year. And the score that you get on that exam will determine if and what kind of credit you will get when you go on to university. Now, most universities will accept some form of advanced uh, placement test for a credit. They'll give you credit for that. Some of them won't. Some universities will not give you advanced standing, which is which credit for that. Um, the universities that don't give you credit are typically the very elite universities like Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, Columbia, those top 20 or 30 universities. So if you do an advanced credit or advanced placement course and you want to go to one of those top universities, they won't give you credit for it, but they won't make you retake the course. They will, uh, they will not give you advanced standing. They'll allow you to skip that course and go directly to the next level but they won't give you credit. So for example, if you take an AP Biology 1 and then you go to Harvard, you don't get credit for AP Biology 1, 
but Harvard does not make you retake AP Biology 1. You can go directly into AP Biology 2. So there's a little bit of an advantage in that you can take higher courses, but they you won't graduate any earlier by taking AP. But it does stand out on your application because it shows that you have taken college level courses before. And again, if you have the experience of taking these courses, that lets the university admissions rep know that you are able to handle it and therefore you're more likely to be accepted. So that's AP. It all comes down to an exam at the end of the year. I think that's one of the problems with AP is that it's not enough like a real university course because you did, your credit does come down to the test at the end of the year, which, you know, I'm not a big person that really loves those, made those you know, uh, big standardized tests. But uh, it, it is a college level course and it, you can get credit for it. So here's just an example of how a Marquette accepts advanced placement credit. Uh, so basically we'll give almost no credit for students if they get a three, except for a few courses here and there. But if a student get a four or a five, then they'll be able to get credit uh, for the course. So for example, if they take biology, um, if they take, let's say art, if they take art and design and they do five, get a five or a four, they'll be able to get this credit, which this is our fine arts 1100. Uh, if they do biology and they get a four, they'll be able to get bio one. If they get biology here, they'll be able to get, if they get a five, they'll be able to get bio one and bio two. So you really need to get a top score. I think from the statistics I've seen, more than half of students that take AP end up not getting the credit for it. So this is one of those things, you know, if you're really good at standardized tests, AP might be a good thing. Uh, if you're not, maybe it's not. Now, your school may offer AP that you can take the AP in your school. You can also take it on your own. You can study it and then go to a testing center to take the, the exam. So AP is one of those. Generally, you will take it in your school. Your school will be an AP school that offers it. But it's possible to take it on, you know, on your own as well. Okay, let's say a little bit about IB. IB is a, the big one these days. It seems it's growing more and more in popularity. Uh, IB stands for International Baccalaureate. It was uh, founded in Switzerland, I, I believe, and it was actually uh, designed as the curriculum for embassy kids. So students who were attending, uh, who were at, at the children of embassy workers and attending international schools, they would take this curriculum called the IB, the International Baccalaureate. And it is a university uh, level curriculum. And students, they need to, again, score pretty high on the exam in order to get the credit for it. So uh, IB has, they actually have four programs, but they really have two programs that are of significance. One is the IBDP, the International D uh, Baccalaureate Diploma Program. So this is the, like, if you do this program, you will actually get a diploma from the IB. Um, and then they have the IBCP, the IB Career Program. Now, this one, I'm, I, I personally am more interested in this. And Marquette is actually discussing a partnership to work with IB for the IBCP. So the IBCP is uh, a little bit different, the career program, in that it focuses more on career studies. So with this, the IBCP, you actually get both the learning experience side and that you're taking some courses from the IB and you get the career side because you're taking uh, what's called a CRS, career related studies. Uh, Justin, yes. Uh, one, one small thing, uh, one is that uh, uh, students who are attending right now, they are CBSC students, the Indian board. So, okay. uh, so uh, one is that and uh, maybe another two, three minutes and then we can take a couple of questions. Okay, sure. So, um, yeah. Yeah, the, the IBCP, uh, I, I mentioned about the IBDP. I do want to tell you about uh, another program to get college credit because, I mean, if you're just taking CBSE, then none of this is even relevant if you're not taking any college courses. But, um, you know, the point of this presentation is to tell you how to build university experience. So these are some of the ways that, that you can do that, both in terms of, you know, working and career-related experience and then educational experience. So, uh, one is dual enrollment. That's where you actually take college courses. Now, you can be a CBSE student and do this program. Um, so you can study college courses from a real U.S. university at the same time as you're taking CBSE courses. And Marquette actually has a program to do that. 
uh, these type of programs are called dual enrollment programs. So essentially, we uh, would allow you in your school, uh, either online or even in person, to take a real college credit courses. And, and the course would count that you're taking would count for high school credit and university credit at the same time. And you'll be able to earn a Marquette University transcript. Uh, and those courses can be transferred to many different universities uh, in the United States, in Canada, in the UK. Um, so if this is something you'd be interested in, I'm, I'm telling you that any of the students, whether in the CBSE, whether you're in a different school, you can do this and you can do it. A lot of the courses that you may already be taking at the CBSE can count for Marquette Explorer credit. So uh, since you know, we're running out of time. I won't go, go too much deeper into the program, but you can see here, these are the courses um, that you can take. And there are so many different options about how to transfer your credits. Uh, you can transfer to partner universities. They give guaranteed admission and they waive the English requirement. Uh, you, they, they, you can find this on their website as well. Uh, you can go to many other universities. These are, these are just the top uh, 80 universities in the US that accept Marquette University credits if you wanted to do this program. Um, or you can go to top universities in Canada, the UK, and Australia as well. So uh, even though you're in the CBSE course, if you do want to get university experience, you can take Marquette Explorer courses. And you can just uh, talk to uh, Gitano or, or your, your local advisor about how to do this program if you are more interested in it. So, all right, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, everybody, so much for your time. It was really great to speak to everybody. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think a uh, lot of students uh, kept on asking questions and it was a very good interactive session. So I'd like to thank Justin, Michael, and of course, Amarnath, who helped us in organizing this with the technical prowhow and marketing provided by Ribhu. So I would like to thank all team members. Uh, students, I wish you all the best and uh, be in touch with us in case you need uh, any of these programs. So we are a partner with IPRC and we'll be very happy to, uh, you know, uh, share the details of the programs and how you can go about it doing step by step. So thanks a lot, Michael, Justin, Amarnath, and Ribu. Thank you. Thank you as well. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye.